Robert Baratheon's victory at the Trident was a turning point in the war for the Iron Throne. While it was clear the gods were smiling on the rebel forces, Aerys Targaryen still held the Red Keep at King's Landing. As Robert was wounded and unable to ride, it was up to Eddard Stark to make for the capital and force the Mad King to give up the throne. Lord Stark reached the city gates to find that Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, had already sacked the city in Robert's name. House Lannister had remained neutral up to this point, ignoring requests for help from both the Crown and the rebels. Now that Robert's eventual victory was assured, it seemed Lord Tywin had finally chosen a side. Lord Eddard was horrified by what he saw when he entered the city. Homes looted and burned, women raped, scores of innocent citizens killed. Disgusted, he led his force up Visenya's hill to the Red Keep. Upon entering the throne room, he found King Aerys lying in a pool of blood, dead by the hand of his own sworn King's guard, Jaime Lannister, who sat brazenly upon the throne. Demanding to know the whereabouts of Queen Rhaela, Lord Eddard was informed the Queen and her son Viserys had been spirited away to Dragonstone before the Lannisters arrived. But other members of the royal family were not as fortunate. Elia Martell of Dawn, who was the wife of Prince Rhaegar, had been raped and murdered by Sir Grigor Clegane on Lord Tywin's orders. Sir Grigor and his man had also butchered Rhaegar's young children. When Robert was well enough to reach the capital, Lord Eddard demanded the Lannisters' answer for their heinous crimes. Robert refused and sent him south to relieve the Baratheon stronghold of Storm's End, which was still under siege by forces loyal to the Crown. Whatever words pass between the two old friends are known only to them, but Lord Eddard is said to have left King's Landing in anger. Later, when Robert was crowned, he appointed John Arryn as Hand of the King. Lord Arryn's first order of business was to broker a truce with the Martells of Dawn who were outraged by the brutal murder of Princess Elia and her children. Following the death of Lyanna Stark, who had been betrothed to Robert, houses Baratheon and Lannister were joined in marriage when the new king took Tywin Lannister's eldest daughter, Cersei, as his queen. As for Eddard Stark, he returned to his stronghold of Winterfell, forever haunted by his sister's death and the shameful way that Robert had secured his throne. The Battle of the Trident may have been an important victory for the usurper, but it was the treachery and barbarism of Tywin Lannister that sealed the fate of the Targaryen dynasty. My father, King Ares, had ever been a friend to the Lions of the Rock, but Ares graciously brought Tywin to court, making him the youngest Hand of the King in history. He gave him power. He gave him respect. He made it possible for Tywin to restore House Lannister to glory. Ares and Tywin governed side by side for 20 prosperous years. Still, when the usurper called his banners in rebellion, Tywin Lannister ignored his king's pleas for help and stayed holed up in his stronghold of Casterly Rock. In time, my brother, Prince Rhaegar, was dead. The realm was in turmoil and the usurper's forces were said to be riding for King's Landing. What a glorious sight it must have been when a force of 10,000 Lannister men showed up at the gate of the capital with Lord Tywin at their head, pledging support to his beleaguered king. Ares opened the gates for his old friend. Instead, Lannister and his men proceeded to plunder and destroy the city that he had called home for decades. As the capital was ravaged and its people terrorized, Jaime Lannister, son of Lord Tywin, proved every bit as treacherous. He killed my father, the king, at the foot of the Iron Throne. The Lannisters entered the Red Keep and Tywin ordered the deaths of the rest of the royal family. It is said Princess Rhaenys was found cowering under her father's bed and put to the sword. 
she was only a child. As for Rhaegar's widow, Elia, she was forced to watch as Lannister thugs dashed her baby son's head against a wall before being raped and murdered herself. As I was the heir to my father's throne, I had been spirited away to Dragonstone with my mother, Queen Rayla, who was with child. As a raging summer storm battered the island fortress and destroyed the Targaryen fleet as it lay at anchor, my sister Daenerys was born. My mother, the queen, died giving birth. Now, some 17 years later, the rightful king still lives in exile. But a day of reckoning is coming. I will sail west as Aegon the Dragon did centuries before. I will take back my father's throne with blood and fire, and I will punish the treacherous dogs who sought to destroy my family, and the people shall rejoice. Family, duty, honor. Every Tully child learns our words, but I was a woman before I understood them. Years before, my father had taken to foster the son of a wartime friend, a minor lord on the fingers. The boy had arrived at our castle as Peter Baelish. Due to his home and size, my brother soon named him Littlefinger. When I came of age, Brandon Stark of Winterfell sought and won my hand. To my father, Brandon was heir to the north and a suitable match for a daughter of House Tully. To me, Brandon was wild and terrifying, never far from laughter or trouble. I loved him with all the fire of a first passion, much I came to realize as Peter loved me. When Peter heard of my engagement, he challenged Brandon to a duel. Peter survived only because I begged Brandon not to kill him. I still thought of Peter as family. Now, I wish I had let him die. Only days before my wedding when I thought to be happy forever, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen abducted Brandon's sister, Lyanna. Hot-blooded as always, Brandon immediately rode for King's Landing to demand justice, which the Mad King Aerys Targaryen gave him, in his own twisted fashion. The day the Raven arrived with the news of my Brandon's death, I locked myself in a room and refused to eat for days, until my father reminded me of my duty. I was to marry Eddard, Brandon's younger brother. A man whom I had never met, though of whom none spoke ill, or spoke anything at all. Our union would cement an alliance of the North, Vale, Stormlands, and Riverlands in rebellion against the Mad King. I was a Tully. I did my duty. We were married quickly, and were spared only one night before he had to return to the field. I spent the war by the windows waiting for a raven to hear if my son would grow up fatherless or at all. We knew the price of defeat. I scoured the kitchens and washing rooms for any and all gossip. Robert had won and crushed the Mad King. Robert had lost, but Jamie Lannister was now king. Robert had almost won, but the Mad King had become a dragon and burned King's Landing to ash. At night, I told myself the war would end soon and bring peace. Either a victory or the grave. I was wrong. Robert won, and my husband avenged his brother and my love. But when he came home to me, he could not meet my eyes. I saw the reason by his side. Many men have bastards, I know. And under the strain of war, any man, no matter how honorable, may forsake his vows for a night of warmth that he may never know again. But Ned Stark was not built like other men. His northern honor would not let him sequester his shame in some distant holdfast. He brought this boy, this Jon Snow, home to raise with his true-born children. My children. Yet even these bitter memories are sweet now. They are all I have left of my Ned. 
Our family is broken and scattered. And our son must wage a war for the pieces. We need to go home. The Starks are of the north, and, like the snows of winter when they come south, they melt away. Though Robert had risked all our lives to win it, the Iron Throne bored him. He cared little for justice, and less for rule. If it weren't women or wineskin, he had no use for it. Without the stalwart John Arryn as Hand of the King, the challenge to Robert's crown would have come much earlier than it did. The Iron Islands have never lacked for treachery. They respect only strength, and honor is as foreign to them as the Seven. After six years, their ruler, Lord Balon Greyjoy, wagered that King Robert had not won the support of the great houses of Westeros, many of whom still named him Usurper. Lord Balon declared the Iron Islands independent and sent his Iron Fleet to Lannispor. Lord Tywin Lannister was careless, and the Ironborn caught and burnt his ships at anchor. Lord Balon and his reavers controlled the Sunset Sea. Robert then ordered me to succeed where his father-in-law, Lord Tywin, had failed. Beneath Robert's fury, I sensed relief, war he could understand. He would smash Lord Balon as he had Rhaegar. I raised Robert's fleet and sailed around Westeros to the Iron Islands. I set a trap for the Iron Fleet off Fair Isle. As sailors and warriors, the Ironborn are unparalleled. But they're not soldiers. They have no discipline, no strategy, no unity. In a battle, each man fights only for his own glory, and their longships are built for lightning strikes and shore raids. When the captains rushed in, I smashed their longships with our larger war galleys. The strength of the Ironborn is in their ships. With the Iron Fleet broken, I had assured Robert's victory. He could now transport troops and siege weapons to invade the Iron Islands. And contrary to Balon's hopes, Robert had plenty of both. I've never seen such allegiance as Robert could inspire in war. Enemies who tried to kill him one day would be drinking with him the next under their own fallen banners. In rebelling against the Iron Throne, Lord Balon did more than Robert ever could to cement his rule. When Robert came to the Iron Islands, he brought with him the full power of Westeros. Sir Barristan Selmy of the King's Guard led the assault on Old Wick, while I subdued Great Wick, the largest of the Iron Islands. But Robert saved the seat of House Greyjoy, Pike, for himself and Lord Eddard. Robert would later boast of the battle's bloodiness and how he could have torn down the island into the waves if Lord Balon hadn't bent the knee. But if I'd have led the assault, Balon's neck would have bent, under his sword. Because I do not forget, I do not pardon. His time will come, all their times will come. Dark wings, dark words. I was only a boy when the Raven came to call my father, Lord Eddard Stark, to another war. Balon Greyjoy had raised the Iron Islands in revolt and burned the Lannister fleet at anchor. King Robert Baratheon again needed his old friend. My mother Catelyn was not happy to lose her lord husband to Robert again. Six years before, he had left her to avenge his father and brother against the Mad King. But now he had sons and daughters of his own, and, unspoken, another son who wasn't hers from the last time he went to war. My brother, Jon Snow. But she knew that in marrying my father, she had married the North. We hold our honor and duty as dear as our old gods. When the time came, my father marched south to restore peace and order to the realm. My father always told me the Iron Islands were a strange and dangerous place. Its people, the Ironborn, keep neither the old gods nor the Seven and despise all honest toil. Their ancestors ravaged the western shores, raping and slaving and putting it to the torch, and their songs still ring through the halls of the Ironborn, while everywhere else, 
their whispered to wayward children at bedtime. Perhaps Lord Balon thought Westeros had not healed from the war against the Mad King, and was as fragmented and suspicious as the ancient kingdoms his forebears had terrorized. Robert's navy corrected him at Fair Isle when they smashed the Proud Iron Fleet. Robert and my father corrected him at Pike, his own castle, when they pulled down his towers and breached his walls. My father never liked to speak of his battles, but from other men I learned what transpired. Thoros of Mir was first through the breach with his flaming sword. Not far behind him was Jorah Mormont of Bear Island, my father's bannerman who earned the knighthood he would later shame, and lords from every corner of the Seven Kingdoms. All day, through every passage in the castle, they fought side by side. My father with our ancestral sword Ice, and King Robert with his war hammer against a horde of axe-wielding ironborn. In the end, Lord Balon bent the knee. King Robert generously allowed Lord Balon to retain his title and castle. The price of peace was custom. The only son of Balon's to survive his foolish rebellion would be taken as a hostage against future treasons. My father even volunteered to foster the boy himself, I suspect, to make Theon Greyjoy a different man than his father, who would bring honor and duty to the Iron Islands when he returned as heir. So my mother's silent fear came true, and my father returned with another child. Theon ate with us, played with us, and fought with us. Once the great bond between my father and Robert Baratheon united the realm against the Mad King and brought him to justice for his crimes. Now, another monster sits on the Iron Throne and another debt of blood is owed my family. Theon is my murdered father's ward. I am my murdered father's son. Like my father and Robert, Bound in blood, if not by blood, we are brothers. When Aegon and his dragons burned Harren the Black and all his sons at Harren Hall, the days when men feared the sight of our long ships were over. Aegon would not permit marauders and raiders in his seven kingdoms. With Harren died our empire and the old way that forged it. But what is dead may never die. Six years after Robert Baratheon won his crown, my father, Balon Greyjoy, sought to restore our ancient rights. He declared the Iron Islands independent and himself its king, and sent the Iron Fleet in a daring raid on Lannisport where they burned the Lannister ships at anchor, making us unchallenged in the Sunset Sea. This was the seed of our undoing. My eldest brother, Roderick, led a frontal assault on Seaguard, a town built to protect the mainland from us. After ferocious fighting beneath the city walls, he was slain by Lord Jason Malister and his men defeated. By this time, Stannis Baratheon had brought Robert's fleet around Westeros and somehow managed to trap the Iron Fleet at Fair Isle, smashing it. Robert's victory was now all but assured, yet we made him bleed for each island. Stannis Baratheon captured Greatwick, the largest of the Iron Islands, and Sir Barristan Selmy himself subdued Old Wick. Robert and Lord Eddard Stark led the main assault against the island of Pike. They razed the town of Lordsport to the ground before Robert turned his full fury on our family's stronghold. When they breached the walls, the first through was Thoros of Mere with his ridiculous flaming sword, followed by every minor lord of Westeros hungry for glory. My other brother Maron was killed when the siege engines brought down a tower on his head. I was now my father's only living son, an heir to the Iron Islands. When my father saw his cause was lost, he wisely conceded defeat to Robert, who otherwise would have pulled down our castle stone by stone with us in it. As my father said to me then, no man has ever died from bending his knee. He who kneels may rise again, blade in hand. He who will not kneel stays dead, stiff legs and all. As it stands, Robert allowed my father to keep his lands and title as Lord of the Iron Islands, King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, Lord Reaper of Pike, for a price. His last son and heir shipped off to Winterfell as an honoured guest. I would eat at the Stark's table and play with the Stark children. And if my father rebelled again, Lord Eddard Stark would take his sword 
and cut off my head. It would be his duty. For three hundred years, the Targaryen dynasty ruled Westeros. Wars were still fought, homes still burned, and men still died. But compared to the chaos of what came before, the realm was stable. And boring. The Targaryens lied, thieved, and killed as much as other lords. They just had dragons to answer all complaints. Until they didn't. When the last dragon died, it was only a matter of time before the Targaryens followed. By only, you mean another century? Which they wasted trying to replace their lost advantage. Incinerating their own palaces to hatch dragon eggs, drinking wildfire to become dragons, and let's not forget the Mad King's favorite, burning men alive so he could pretend to be a dragon. We urged Aerys to pardon Brandon Stark. The boy had threatened Prince Rhaegar, but Rhaegar had stolen the boy's sister. And the boy was the eldest son of our Warden of the North. Who's the greater fool? A Mad King or the man who reasons with him? Ares saw knives in every shadow. When you told him to treat the Starks with caution, you made him afraid. And what he feared, he killed. I wouldn't have thought you of all people would bother with recriminations for Brandon's death, Lord Baelish. Not after your, shall we call it, duel with him? Brandon was as arrogant as he was stupid. Like his father, Lord Stark, who answered Ares' summon to the capital. They earned their fates. But the younger son, Ned, what was his crime? That Ares ordered his death as well. Unlike men, families don't die when you lop off their head. At the very least, you should have pointed out that loyal and dutiful Ned was living with John Arryn, a proud and over-righteous lord with an impregnable castle and no sons of his own. Perhaps you could have spared Aerys the embarrassment of revolt. If only we'd had the foresight to consult you, Lord Baelish, but I suppose first we'd have had to know who you were. Nobody knew Robert Baratheon either, yet he claimed the right to sit on the Iron Throne. He had Targaryen blood, through his mother. A pretty dress for an ugly truth. It was war, and he could swing a hammer harder than the other options. When did you know you'd lost, Lord Varys? When Robert Baratheon killed Prince Rhaegar on the Trident. Wrong. You lost the war when you let Ned Stark slip back into the North. Neither the bloody gate of the Vale or Mort Kaelin in the north have ever fallen. They could have held out for years, even if you'd killed Robert. Would you let him slip through your fingers as well? I told the court that Robert was hiding in the Stony Sept, but the hand of the king wasted too much time searching the city. Something about the glory of single combat. Then Ned Stark's army arrived to save the day. Too bad Lord Tywin wasn't hand any longer. He would have simply raised the town and been done with it. Perhaps. And perhaps the rebels would have found even more of the countryside flocking to their banners. I'd almost forgotten. You weren't always so loyal to the Lannisters during the war, were you? I did my duty to the realm. When Lord Tywin showed up at King's Landing professing loyalty, I warned Aerys not to open the gates. Prince Rhaegar was dead, our army scattered. The lion does not stir unless he smells meat. I admire your powers of persuasion, Lord Varys. Few could traffic in so many secrets to so little avail. Grand Maester Pycelle told Ares what he wanted to hear, that his old friend Tywin was there to save him. Then Ares' old friend sacked the city, and his son stabbed Ares in the back. A regrettable, though necessary, action. As were the pardons the new King Robert bestowed on the Royalists, Mace Tyrell, Barristan Selmy, you. King Robert wisely chose order over vengeance. John Arryn wisely chose for Robert, but John Arryn died. Then Robert, then Ned. So ended their glorious revolution. And Westeros has been burning ever since. Let it. How Targaryen of you. 
one of the mad ones. Fire turns even the proudest oaks to ash, leaving newer roots space to climb. Barrison the Bold, they call me to my face. I know what they say behind my back. Barristan the Old. And it's true. I am old, with hair as white as all the winters I've seen. The older a man grows, the less sleep he needs. These days, I barely sleep at all. When darkness falls over this strange city, I find myself visited by the faces of the kings I have served, the faces of those I swore to protect, the faces of those I failed. All I ever wanted was to live a life of honor, defending a king worthy of service. During the War of the Ninepenny Kings, I sought out Malus the Monstrous, last of the Blackfire Pretenders who had started this whole war. Melis believed that his Targaryen blood gave him a claim to the Iron Throne. I made sure his blood claimed nothing more than the dirt around his corpse. To show his gratitude, the king elevated me to his king's guard. It was the proudest moment of my life. But that king died, and I wasn't with him. Not that I could have saved him if I had been, but still, I vowed to do better with his son, the young Prince Ares. For twenty years, his reign was peaceful and prosperous. Ares was well-loved by his subjects and respected by his lords. But as years went on, Ares' temper soured. He became obsessed with dragons and fire, and the swords of the king's guard couldn't defend him from the enemies he saw lurking in every shadow. My king went mad. But there was hope. His son and heir... Prince Rhaegar was everything a kingdom could hope for in a ruler. He was strong, but gentle, wise, and cautious, and a good friend. No matter the wounds Ares dug into the realm, we had faith that his son would sew it back together again when he ascended the throne. Then came Lord Wendt's tourney at Harrenhal, the largest ever in Westeros. I unhorsed every man against me until only Prince Rhaegar remained. We each set our feet in our saddles and lowered our lances and charged. And I fell. Muddy and bruised, I then watched Rhaegar present Lyanna Stark with the victor's crown of roses, though she was betrothed to Robert Baratheon. And Rhaegar himself was married to Elia Martell. We all know what happened after. If I'd been a bit quicker with my lance, if I'd chosen a faster horse, perhaps I could have spared the kingdom from the destruction that came after. Or if I'd thought to warn Brandon Stark against his rashness. He came to King's Landing himself, demanding Rhaegar return his sister. Poor fool. If he'd only known the depth of Ares' madness, he wouldn't have dared provoke him. Ares ordered Brandon imprisoned, and I could do nothing but obey. When Brandon's father, Lord Rickard Stark, came to King's Landing to beg for his son, Ares burned him alive. But I could do nothing but watch. I had sworn a vow to a mad king, and was honor-bound to obey him, even at the cost of my soul. Ravens soon arrived with dark news for the king. The Vale was in open revolt. Demanding Lyanna Stark's return, Robert Baratheon was smashing any army that dared face him. Eddard Stark, Brandon's younger brother, was marching the whole of the north down the neck and had taken Catelyn Tully Brandon's betrothed for his own, thus winning the support of the Riverlands. The king sent ravens to Casterly Rock to beg his former hand, Tywin Lannister, for help. And no ravens returned. A plan was devised. Prince Rhaegar would personally lead the royal forces, now reinforced with 10,000 Dornishmen, north to face Robert. Of the king's guard, Lewin Martell and I would ride with the prince. Before we left, the prince confided in me that when he returned from this battle, there would be a great many changes in court. Despite my vows to the king, I confess I was excited. On the march to face Robert's army, we were sure we'd win. We had superior numbers, and we had Prince Rhaegar. His presence lifted the spirits of our men, and he looked every inch the king he was destined to become. But at the trident, the gods played a cruel joke. Robert proved the Baratheon words as his army smashed through our lines. Lewin Martell was killed. 
I fell in combat badly wounded and could do nothing but watch as Robert's Warhammer ended Rhaegar's glorious reign before it began. And the kingdom that would never be washed away down the trident with his life blood. And that Robert spared me, insisting his personal maester tend to my wounds out of respect. But respect for what? A king's guard shouldn't survive one king, let alone two, and one who should have been. I swore an oath to House Targaryen, and I failed him. All that's left of their fire is a single ember halfway across the world, surrounded by darkness. If the gods were good, I would still be young in the fullness of strength, but whatever the cost, I will not let this ember go out. This time, I will not fail. <laughs>